What's up, everybody? This is the Welcome to the Show podcast brought to you by Audible. CT, have you ever used Audible before? Yes, I have, Manny. You have? Really? Could you tell us yes. which book you listened to on Audible? Uh, it was that Satchel Page book of the uh, interview that we did a while back in season one. You guys should go check that interview out, Satchel Page. Ooh, that book was called The Pitcher and the Dictator. It details the story of when Satchel Page went to go pitch for the Dominican for Ciudad Trujillo. And basically, he put his life on the line to win a baseball game. Uh, for the team. I didn't know that that book was available on Audible. That's more reason for why people should sign up for Audible by using our link. Go to audibletrial.com forward slash welcome to the show and you can get a free audiobook download just like the one CT just talked about for free. And you get a free uh, 30 day trial. So go check it out, people. Audibletrial.com forward slash welcome to the show. One more thing, CT. I don't know if these people listening ha- uh, know this yet, but if you take two minutes to review our podcast, drop a five star review and leave a rating, the Welcome to the Show podcast will get a boost in in our ratings, so to speak, and more people could uh, could find our show. Um, not only that, if you drop a uh, if you drop a review of our show, we will select one and read it on the air, and you will enter to win a chance for something amazing that i don't yes. know what it is yet <laughs> so so let me just let me just add to that if you're someone that has already has reviewed the show and you love it so much go make a secondary email account and review it again Ooh. for to double your chances to win wow that that would be amazing uh <laughs> we're putting so off def- we're, do- we're doing it man we're doing it we're doing this guys so definitely do that and as we start every show ct what's good I'm good, man. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm a little pissed off right now because I'm, as we record this, I'm trying to watch the Yankees versus the Orioles game. But where I live in Pennsylvania is it's a blessing and a curse because I get every Washington Nationals game. I get every Pittsburgh Pirates game. I get every Nationals game. I get every, um, what's another team? I get every Baltimore Orioles game. I'm in that area where I get a nice, a decent amount of games here. So I don't even bother to pay for MLB TV, like the whole package. But because I'm a diehard Yankees fan, I pay for the Yankee package because I don't get Yankees games. However, the Yankees are playing the Baltimore Orioles today. And where I'm currently located, I don't have my cable box. But I do have a computer and I do have a Roku. So I'd love to stream it on MLB TV, but the game is blacked out. So... I'm pretty pissed off about that because if I pay for something and I want to watch something that I pay for, I want to be able to watch it. I don't I, what, like, why do I have to be, why do we, what's with these blackout restrictions? They don't make any sense. Yeah. Um, honestly, like the way I always picture streaming, like the, the advantage of streaming is that if I'm on a bus on a public bus somewhere, maybe I'm just on the, at the park or something i should be if i'm paying for a service i should be able to watch that game anywhere that's the whole point of streaming so it's kind of annoying when you know we're in the tri-state area and i can't watch a yankees game i can't watch a mets game or maybe i'm i like the team that they're playing i can't watch those games because those games are televised through cable here where we're at but i just think that's so stupid because then what's the point of of this you know what's the what are we paying for if we can't watch every game, you know? Right. And if you're so if you're a subscriber to if you have a cable package, which I do. So I'm already paying this cable package who I'm assuming pays Major League Baseball for for them to have their content, for for them to have MLB the MLB network or mm-hmm. whatever channels are here that air all these baseball games or whatever. And then on top of that, I'm giving Major League Baseball more money so that I can watch a team that I like then why am i being punished and if 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 i'm the if i'm the type of person that i'm such a die hard yankees fan and i can't get home for 6:30 for my game and i live back in new york let's say and i want to catch it on my phone while i sit on the bus or whatever i can't watch it because of where I, where i'm currently you know situated on the, on yeah. <laughs> on this earth it just doesn't make any sense no and that's and that's just like a typical situation that I'm thinking of because I'm actually I, I live around here. So Yankees games, Mets games are all blacked out. 
through the uh, MLB TV app, whatever. But you're in Pennsylvania. You can't even watch the Yankees versus Baltimore game. Like, no. And they're in Baltimore. Like, I think that's even crazier. That's even worse. Yeah, and I, I, I like it's almost it's a similar situation because I could just watch the MLB the the Baltimore Orioles broadcast. Let's say, but let's say that I did have a cable box with me right now, and I just don't want to listen to the Baltimore Orioles announcers. I want to listen to Michael Kay and Ken Singleton or whatever. Why can't I do that? At least let me get if 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 you want to black out the the local announcers or whatever, fine. At least let me get my the Yankee announcers since I pay for the yeah. Yankees. You know what I'm saying? Like I don't know. Yeah, you should. If you're paying for a service, you should have the you should have the option to want to listen to Mike. I like listening to Michael K. Personally, yeah, he's too. he's like an unbiased uh, commentator. I like listening to Michael K. I listen to his radio show almost every day. So I would I would choose the Michael K. broadcast versus the maybe the opposing team's broadcast. So yeah, yeah like I feel like you're paying. For, and the thing is, I have T-Mobile. I get MLB TV for free. Nice. Shout out to T-Mobile. Uh, but you're actually paying for it. I think that's. Yeah. It's just crazy to me how this is like an, an issue, you know? Word. Third world, I mean, first world problems, CT. First world <laughs> problems. <laughs> yeah, it really is. It really is. <laughs> All right. I want to stick, I want to stick with, I'm going to, we're going to skip the, we're going to hold on, not skip. We're going to, we're going to have the Game of Thrones recap, but we're going to save it to the end of the show um, instead of the beginning of the show. So stick around. If you want to listen to CT's recap of Game of Thrones, the final episode, uh, that's going to come up at the very end of the show. Uh, but for now, I want to stick in New York for a second. Not with the Yankees, but with the Crosstown team, the New York Mets. The New York Mets. Mm. Mets. Wow. Um, feels like feels like we haven't ripped the Mets at all this season. Oh, oh, it's coming. So the Mets, <laughs> <laughs> the Mets have lost five straight games and were swept by the Miami Marlins this past weekend. Um, in the last two games of that series with the Marlins, they were shut out twice and were only to, able to come up with three hits. Um, the game also featured two base running blunders by Robinson Cano, which he's famous for. Everybody knows that Cano doesn't, you know, necessarily uh, hustle out grounders. Um, there were two instances of this, and Mets fans went crazy, crazy um, over the weekend. Uh, to the point where some reporters stopped Mickey Calloway. Not they didn't stop him. They were talking to Mickey Calloway and they asked him this question. Listen in. All the discussion about Cano the last couple of ga- uh, game games, is it acceptable in your mind for him not to run that ball out? Well, there? I mean it, things are piling up on on Robbie right now. I mean come on, let's face it. You know you hit to a double play, the the ball lands foul and spins into fair territory you know he, he hit it he looked down he saw it hit foul and by the time he looked back up the ball had spun into fair territory and the play was over um you know he realizes he has to run i don't th- you know it, it's it's not like he's doing that on purpose i mean anybody in their right mind knows that nobody would do that it's just piling up on him and then it's tough man you know it's uh stuff happens like that when things are going bad so he met, he says that they're that things are piling up on Cano. Um, do you first off? Do you think that that what's going on with Cano is a problem? And do you think that people are just piling on, piling it up on him? Um, so I don't rem- I I don't think I saw the first base running blunder that Cano had. So I'm I I can't give a comment on that one. But the second one that happened over the weekend, I didn't. You know, honestly, the ball did hit foul and then rolled fair. Yeah, maybe he should have made an effort to run, but I think that was a, a double play regardless. I mean, that was just going to be a double play no matter what. So I think people are blowing out of proportion because, one, he had the previous blunder, and, two, because the Mets are doing so bad right now, and they need somebody to blame. Yeah. Uh, so so I don't think it was the biggest deal on the second one. I, I didn't see the first one. The second one I completely understand. I mean, he still should have made an effort to run. I, I don't think any baseball player should ever just like, assume that the play is off or whatever, but... Again, the ball hit foul. The ball started foul and then rolled fair. You know, heads up play by the catcher, and it was a double play. I think it was going to be a double play regardless. So I, I think people are making a bigger deal out of it because Robinson Cano is making so much money, and because the Mets are doing so bad right now. Yeah, and I think it's it's also prior history. It's that Cano has a reputation of not running balls yeah. out. So you know that it's pissing people off they're they're projecting you're right i think that they're upset because their team isn't performing well i think the the marlins defeated jacob de grom and noah Syndergaard, if i'm not mistaken yeah they did they did and Syndergaard pitched 
a, a pretty decent game on Sunday, only allowed two runs. The Mets couldn't, they couldn't, you know, they two hits total. And on Saturday, they were only able to put together one hit against the worst team in baseball, the Miami Marlins, a team that's on pace to have the worst record um, in the modern era since 1920. Um, wow. So it's, you know, I don't know, man. A- and then so so this led, led to something else. This horrible stretch that the Mets are under led to another question that's floating around. Um, and some reporters asked Mickey Calloway, uh, whether or not Mickey Calloway's, uh, whether, not Mickey Calloway, they asked Brody Van Wagenen if Mickey Calloway's job is in danger. Um, let's hear what he had to say. But as the team treads water, is his job in danger? You know, look, I, I think as I said before, our job is to support Mickey and the coaching staff. Our job is to support the players, and uh, we expect to win. So we will uh, we'll continue to hold ourselves accountable for that. And then today, apparently, it came out that the the front office spoke with the team and said that Mickey Calloway's job is not in danger. I guess that they're behind him 100%. Um, I don't know if I blame the manager. I think that I that I struggle with, with blaming managers in today's game because so much of what happens on the field comes from the front office and from the analytics department. Um, but there's just something about Mickey Calloway that's been rubbing me the wrong way. I don't know if I could put it into words or, or what, but there's just something about him that lately is just i don't know it's 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 like not his decision making is is just insane and some of the things that he says in these post game uh conferences are just i don't know man i don't know yeah honestly like i i know last year when when mickey calloway took over i I just remember always questioning his his answers to the questions that the media had for him the most recent one that i that i can recall is i'm I'm sitting there watching like you know the highlights in the morning like i always do whatever and there and mickey callaway kind of says you know no no game is a must win for me until game seven of the world series yeah that's i'm crazy. like <laughs> i'm thinking to myself like game one of the world series is a must win yeah game one of game one of the AL, of the nlcs for you is a must win I feel like until you and and again, I think it's impossible for every nine, you know, starting nine to be on the same mindset. I think some players on some mm-hmm. players are. I think it's impossible for everybody on the team to be on the same mindset. But you should be playing out every game like until you clinch the number one spot in the playoffs. Until then, everything is pretty much a must win because that puts you in the best position to get to the World Series. Yeah, the best team might not always get to the World Series, but they're always in the best position to get to the World Series, you know? And there's just a lot of things that he says and um even though even though I think Robinson Cano isn't as uh guilty of him being lazy on those base paths, maybe maybe uh, Mickey Callaway should be a little bit more assertive in in disciplining Robinson Cano to mm-hmm. set an example or something, you know, even then. Cuz you can't you can't lose to the Marlins. Yeah. You know, you can't get swept by the Marlins. And m- mind you, the two games they lost prior to that, the five-game losing streak, was to the Nationals. The Nationals aren't doing shit this year. Yeah, they're 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 not too far behind, not too far ahead of the Marlins. No, and since you know you're you're losing you're losing to a division, I don't know rival. I I would consider the Nationals rivals, but you're losing to two teams in your division, man. Like, come mm-hmm. on, like. Yeah, and and you made these moves, and you know what, Brody Van Wagenen doesn't get doesn't escape this scot free either. Um, but sticking with Mickey Calloway real quick, yeah, those kinds of comments, if I'm a player, I'm looking at that, and I, I'm kind of losing a little bit of respect for this manager because to to say some shit like that, like no game no game is a must win unless it's a game seven of the World Series, okay, you know, the, these losing streaks that you're, that you're currently under right now could have an impact on you at the end of the year, which which determines whether or not you go to the World Series, you know what I'm saying? Like every game matters, you know what I mean? Um, and, and that's just not acceptable. That's one of the things, if I bring it back to the New York Yankees real quick about Derek Jeter, that, that I, that I really liked was that every game he played as if it was game seven of the world series, every game was a must win. And that's how it should be. I think that winning organizations have that in mind at all times. And I think that, that this is, this exemplifies for me, sorry, Mets fans, but this exemplifies the Mets. The Mets to me are just like, they can't get out of their own way. And and what I was going to say about Brody Van Wagenen is he made all these moves to make this team competitive and they're not competitive. So, you know, no, at some the same point thing as last year. Yeah. People have to start looking at Brody Van Wagenen and, and start asking questions like, OK, 
what's going on here? What are you going to do about this? You know what I'm saying? Like, are, are you going to step in and make a managerial change? There's a guy out there by the name of Joe Girardi who's itching to get back on the field, and and he would be. I think he would be the perfect replacement for a guy like Mickey Callaway. Some guy who can a guy who can lay down the law and and knows how to win games, um, yeah. but I don't know, man. Not just that, not just that, man. Joe Girardi. I mean, I'm not saying he was like this wizard at handling the media, but he was a lot better than Mickey Calloway was. Yeah. And speaking of you know, uh, just adding all this to Mickey Calloway, you read you read over the weekend after Jacob Degrom's loss, he he did he did lose to the Marlins. He le- the Marlins legit tacked on runs on DeGrom. I wasn't yeah. expecting it, but it happened, whatever. But Mickey Callaway doesn't allow DeGrom to have his own personal catcher. So apparently DeGrom struggles with Wilson Ramos and I guess DeGrom would would prefer Thomas Nitto or however you say his last name. Mm-hmm. And Mickey Callaway's like, "No, you're not going to get your own personal ca- you know, your own personal catcher." And I'm just thinking the whole time, like Sonny Gray got his own personal catcher when he was on the Yankees. Yeah, right. And we're we're talking about Sonny Gray, not not Cy Young Degrom. You know, like right. it's Sonny Sonny Gray got a personal catcher. Give Degrom his personal. Your team isn't hitting anyways. Mm-hmm. I know Wilson Ramos is the probably top five hitting catchers in in the major leagues, but you know, get it done with the other eight guys. Give give Degrom his personal catcher. Yeah, and Mickey Callaway was brought to this organization because. He was considered a pitching guru guru with the Cleveland Indians uh, a couple of years back. And if this is how he's treating his pitchers, I mean, then what's, what purpose does this guy serve? DeGrom served up six runs against the Marlins in five innings. And in his last three games, let me pull up his stats. I mean, they haven't all been bad. But in his last no, three no. games, he has a 4-2-6 ERA. His record is 1-2. and two. Um, So, you know, this is your ace. If your ace is saying to you, I feel more comfortable with another catcher, then you do what you need. You you do what you need to do to make your ace feel comfortable. Because any any game you lose when your ace is on the mound is a waste for me. And and as it currently stands right now, Jacob Degrom again has a losing record this season at three and five. So maybe mm-hmm. there's maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe maybe it is that he doesn't like pitching to to Wilson Ramos. Three games. He's had three games already this year, um, in which he's given up five or more runs. And he he he's this is the same pitcher who broke that who tied Bob Gibson's record of consecutive quality starts. He's he already has three games um in his last I think six starts or so that aren't quality starts. They're like horrible starts. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So do whatever you can to to make this guy feel comfortable on the mound and maybe there's something wrong with the ground. Maybe he, he still doesn't feel well after after he, you know, potentially could have ended up on the IL a few weeks back. The Mets are just a joke, man. Like I don't know. I, yeah. Like I don't even want to waste another minute on this team right now. <laughs> and usually, and usually, usually, I'm ripping Noah Syndergaard. I, I always thought. He, I mean, I I'm not gonna lie and tell you that I always thought he was overrated. There was a point for me where Noah Syndergaard for me became a little bit overrated. He was more of just like the power pitcher, yeah, throwing a hundred, you know, seven innings straight, whatever. Give credit to him for putting together a real good start when the team needed it because they're about to get swept by the Marlins. And he puts together a beautiful start. Only gave up two runs, seven innings. Great. Oh, 82 pitches, by the way. That's the key thing. Uh, that's the lowest amount of pitches that he's thrown all year in the game. 82 mm-hmm. pitches. And beautiful start by Noah Syndergaard. But then the Mets get one hit or two hit, was it? Two hits. By Alacantara? Like, yeah. Who the hell knows? I don't know. I don't even know and, who the Marlins are. They have, a worse, they have a worse attendance than a minor league team. <laughs> yeah, and just be and just because we're ripping the Mets now, I'm just gonna throw this out there. I looked up today why, because I'm always annoyed by like the their home jerseys, the white jerseys with the blue letters and the and the orange outlines. Mm. And I'm always thinking to myself, I like the black ones, the all black jerseys with the blue. It's yeah. literally the same jersey except black. The white jerseys for me look ugly as shit. And I looked up the reason why. I'm like, what? Are, what? What? Are, what do the Met colors mean? And I can't say that this is a valid source, but it's the first one I pulled up. Apparently, the blue is for the. It's Dodgers. about the history of yeah history of the New York teams. The blue is for the Brooklyn Dodgers. The orange is for the uh, New York Giants when they were there. And are the, are, and do the pin, like, are so sometimes I don't know if they still have them, but they used to have pinstripes. Did that you can, don't tell me that that represented the Yankees. I mean, did you check that? No, I didn't. I didn't check into that, but you're right. They do have pinstripes on. They used to at least. I know that the yeah. Mets used to have pinstripes, but. That's that that for me is more the reason why they should just scrap that low you know, keep keep the black ones if you want to, because yeah. the black I feel is looks 
it looks like kind of cool. I'm not gonna lie, I, I'll, I'll support that. I always think of Mike Piazza in the black Mets jersey. Yeah, that's like and, in the year 2000 in that area. Yeah, area. but the, but those white ones are just so ugly to me. Like if I was owner of the Mets, the first thing I would do is just scrap that. I'd change it back to the Metropolitans at least temporarily <laughs> or something. I don't know, man. That's yeah. That's that just me. That's just me ripping the Mets a little bit more. You know, just kicking them while they're down. <laughs> I think. I mean, I think I've said this. I think I said this last season. I think that what you just said right now is one of the reasons why this organization is such a joke because they don't even have their own identity you know what i mean like like the the it feels like that yeah like the the cubs for a while were the lov- the lovable losers the red sox for a while were the team waiting for the second shoe to drop or whatever the yankees for a while were the organization that exemplified success maybe not so much anymore you know teams have like an identity the the cardinals consistency you know the a's moneyball the mets what do you think about when you when you when you think about the Mets? Like they don't have an identity. I just think the Mets to me are a team that they give you hope at the start of every season. Like they do a few signings, they you know, they do whatever they gotta do to give you hope. They're never they always start off the season where people never rank them as low as the Marlins, obviously. But they always have stretches and I'm talking about like months of stretch stretches where they play like a team that is supposed to be ranked as the lowest team. And mm-hmm. I guarantee you, and obviously anything could change, but the way that things are going now, I guarantee you the Mets start clicking some point in, I don't know, like mid-August when it's already too late to grab the division. They'll start yep. clicking, and then and then they'll go into next season with the hope of what the team was doing at the end of la- of this season. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, again, they have to start acting like they're a big market team. Like – there's a Dallas Keiko available out there. There's a Craig Kimbrell available out there. Uh, they just lost a reliever today. Lugo um, is on the IL. Um, start acting like a big market team or you're not going to compete against the Phillies and the Braves. The, they're lucky yeah. that the Braves ha- haven't been winning as many games. Um, Fulton Nevis. I don't even want to get into Fulton Nevis, but the team is, you know, they're, they're barely above 500. So yeah. they're missing out on huge opportunities to compete in this in this division. And typical Mets, man. Oh, we didn't even mention Cespedes gets oh injured my God, yeah. on his ranch. Like, I'm surprised we didn't lead with that. But Jonas Cespedes forgot that he was even a part of this roster. Injures, breaks his, you know, fractures his ankle or whatever the hell it is mm-hmm. in his ranch. Like, can it get any worse, man? <laughs> yeah. It's some, Mark Carrig, I think his name is, from The Athletic uh posted a joke tweet that he broke he fractured his ankles in multiple spots apparently this is the report that came out that, that he fractured his ankle in multiple spots and he said that because he was riding something a non-horse apparently so he was riding something he's saying that it's not a horse but how do you fracture your ankle on your ranch like what were you doing you know what i mean and I and mean, cespedes has been cespedes is known for uh here it is so anthony DeComo breaking Joanna cespedes fractured his ankle in an accident on his ranch in florida no more info for now maybe there's more here cespedes suffered a violent fall and twisted his right ankle in a hole oh so he wasn't writing anything per gm brody van wagen and he was not riding a horse the gm said but it was a non-baseball related activity van wagen did not elaborate further and did not offer a timetable for cespedes's recovery um you know, I don't know. I mean, the, the, what I was saying was that Cespedes in the past, while he was on the DL at the time, had been seen golfing and shit like that. And, yeah, yeah, I remember. You know, like, it's and, just, yo, get your shit together, Mets. And I know that, and I know that accidents happen and everything, and yeah. maybe it's not fair to rip Cespedes. But then ask yourself, why is it always the Mets? And why is you it know? always Cespedes too? <laughs> and why is it always Cespedes, man? Like, and and I don't know, man. Like, if you guys signed, you, you're right. You're a New York market team. Like, go out there and sign Bryce Harper when you had the chance or Machado when you had the chance. I'm not saying those guys would have turned your season around, but I feel like that would at least have, like, forced a new culture into your organization. At least, at the very least, you sign a big mark, a, a superstar like that, and mm-hmm. you're basically injecting your market with, like, a with like a wake-up call or something. Yep. And here, here's another, another thing, CT, that I just saw on Twitter from Mike Puma. Cano was benched tonight. So if you're listening to this, we record on 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 uh, on Monday night. So Cano is, isn't playing tonight. And according to 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 Mickey Callaway, uh, 
part of the reasons is because is Mickey Calloway punishing him for failing to run. According to Cano, he says that it was never mentioned to him that he's on the bench tonight, partly for failing to run. Um, Cano seems to be under the impression that this was a prearranged day off. So, I mean, the shit just when it rains, it pours with this organization. Yeah, now there's a lack honestly. of communication between player and manager. I don't even know how Mickey Calloway keeps his job, to be honest with you. I know that the Mets I don't express confidence in the guy, but it, to me, it seems like there's no way that this guy can keep his job at this point. Yeah, I don't know either, honestly. Yeah. Well, let's move on from the Mets, man. Okay. <laughs> All right, so as we said last week, I swear to God, CT, that this is the place where if we talk about something, the I think either it comes to, into fruition or, or that player becomes a key player the, the following week. It happened when we talked about Rafi Devers. Um, we talked about Michael Chavis, and he kind of slowed down a little bit, but then he had a big hit, too, uh, prior to us recording last week. And then last week, we also talked about Vlad Jr. and how all it's going to take is for him to hit one home run or... Or something like that, and he's going to go on a streak. Well, in his first 13 games, Vlad was hitting 191 with a 283 on base and a 234 slugging. He had zero home runs. Since then, in his six games this past week, he's hitting 333 with a 417 uh, on base and a 905 slugging. He's also hit four home runs. One of them sounded like this. Guerrero gets to hit with a runner on base. Vladdy Guerrero is 0 for 1. There he goes. Ball is hit high and deep to center field. Goes here back. Get up, ball. Get up. Off the glove and out of here. A two-run home run for Vladimir Guerrero. So I chose to play that sound because when a player gets on a streak, I've noticed in baseball, they get every help in the world imaginable. Yeah. And in that play, he got an outfield assist from the center fielder. I can't remember who it was. But it landed in the center fielder's glove, and then it bounced off and went over the fence. It was his third home run of the season. Yeah. Uh, what I mean, what do you have to say about this? Do you think that Do you think that Vlad is is you know is he the real deal? Like, is has has he arrived? Yeah, I mean, I think I don't think there's any doubt that he's meant to play at the at the at the highest level, and that he's going to succeed hitting. <clears throat> but. You know, I I don't want to I don't want to put any more of my like assumptions on a player because like he's he's only like twenty or nineteen, whatever he the hell yeah. he is. You know, I think I think it's amazing that he's even in the major league in in the major league system right now. So has he arrived? Yeah, probably because he has four home runs over the weekend or since you know however many games it's been. Uh, I just wish I hope that he is what we think he's gonna be because that's just good for baseball. So yeah. Yeah, I like Vlad. I like. I think he's. I think he's good. I think that that when like what I ha what we have seen is that he's not a liability defensively. He's a good defending third baseman, which is a plus. Yeah. Um, he when he makes contact with the baseball, he he rips it like he hits it hard. Um, so offensively, I think he's the real deal too. And I think that as as we speak right now. When I think of the Toronto Blue Jays roster, I think he's the best player on the team already. And he, you know, yeah. we barely have seen anything from him yet. Um, this guy yeah. Sogard has been really good this season, but I don't think that's, you know, I think that's kind of, I think that'll level off eventually. But um, I'm glad to see it. And I just hope that he can sustain this, that he stays healthy. I hope it's not like a Prince Fielder type situation. Um, but I yeah. I was going to say, yeah, I was going to say, like, speaking of Prince Fielder, you know, Vlad, Vlad Jr.'s body is... I don't want to say I've never seen it before, but it's kind of odd. Like, I feel like he has a baby face, yet his body is just so massive. Like, he has He's a big, lot yeah. of, yeah, like, he has a lot of uh, surface area, <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> and offensively, yeah, you're right. Offensively, I think he's a real deal. And it kind of the way he's been playing defense kind of makes me question when they when they rank these prospects or when they – you know, when they dissect these prospects, what's the bar that they're setting? Is it Nolan Arenado? Because no, he's not Nolan Arenado, but he's not Miguel Andujar either. You know, he's he's it looks like he can make the routine plays and he can move. a little bit. Yeah, even a little bit more than that. So, yeah, he can move. He can I'm, move. I'm curious, like how they rank these players, because even 
I'm going to be honest with you. Even though Miguel and Duhar's defense has always been suspect, the way that they described it is like they couldn't even find a spot on the roster for him, how bad his defense might have been. But last year, even though the metrics might say something else, I didn't think Miguel and Duhar was the worst third baseman I've ever seen, you know? Really? Uh, he was pretty bad, man. I mean, I'm talking about making routine plays. It's the major leagues. Like, you're sitting at the hot corner. I don't expect every average third baseman to just make the, you know, the bullets that come at you at that corner. Yeah. But I saw Miguel and Duhar make some routine plays. I, I just, I'm curious at what they set the bar at for these rookies or these prospects. Yeah. I mean, I could I do what Miguel and Duhar does at third base? No way in hell. But compared to big league players, that you could tell that he was the worst defensive third third baseman in baseball last season. Um, but his bat did a lot of work, did did a lot of talking too, and I think that it kind of made up for it a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, at, at the same time, the Yankees still won a hundred games with Andujar at third base, so it didn't hurt them that much. Like, how much, how many more games could they have won with with a a defensively like a good defensive third baseman you know let's say it was Gio Urshela instead of Urshela I can never say his name instead yeah. of Miguel Andujar would they have won 100 games would they have one more would they have one less I don't know I think they did just fine with him there um yeah. and he works at it you see that he works at it during the offseason he's always posting videos he's working on it the Yankees there's always reports on him working on his defense he didn't look good this year again defensively but like you said, third base is in an easy position to learn, and he was a year early. So, and once you're up here, you're not, you know, the, you're still developing. But shit like that kind of takes a back seat because you have to survive on the big league field. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's kind it's kind of like he was here a year early, and now now that he's done his work for that one rookie season, it's kind of like once he goes a little bit bad, people kind of you know it bail on him a little bit. Yeah. yeah. All right. I agree. So speaking of. Players that are on fire. Um, you have Freddie Freeman hit four homers last week. He did them all in four straight games. He could still, he, if he hits a home run tonight, Monday, he would have hit five straight uh, home runs. He he's currently two hundred. He uh, currently has two hundred career home runs. Um, and so this is my question, real quick, because Josh Bell has also arrived too. Like Josh Bell is a freak right now. Yeah. Who would you take at first base, Josh Josh Bell? Or Freddie Freeman? I'm taking... Ooh. That's a good question because I feel like Josh Bell isn't just hitting home runs. He's hitting, you know, farthest home runs type of thing, like exit velocities, through the roof type of type of home runs. But I'm I'm taking Freddie Freeman, man. He's he, Freddie Freeman has been so consistent mm -hmm. more than Josh Bell has. I know Josh Bell has a smaller sample size, but the fact that Josh Bell hit 12 home runs last year... And I know he it was only his third season, or I guess I don't know if you count that first year. He only played forty five games, but Josh Bell being in his third season, I mean, he's twenty five. Like I, I don't yeah. think a guy like that should settle for twelve home runs, or or you know. And it's not like he he had the chance to hit plenty more. So I'm gonna go with Freddie Freeman. Yeah, I think Freddie Freeman is more consistent. You know what you're gonna get from Freddie Freeman on yeah. a yearly basis. Um, whereas with Josh Bell, like, like you said, it's like, you still kind of don't know what you're going to get from him. Like in my mind, I'm thinking how much of this has to do with, with the baseball right now, because there's clearly something going on with the baseball in baseball, yeah. because yeah. it seems like everybody's on fire every week. When I write this, uh, this, this, uh, the player, the, the player power rankings, I'm like this, what? Tommy LaStella, all of a sudden, like the Cubs just that, let him walk. You know what I mean? That, like, one, that one was random because I, I don't think Tommy LaStella ever hit. He's hit more home runs this season than I think he's hit in the last, I don't know how many years combined, you know? Chris, Christian Vasquez already has a career high in home runs. That's crazy. But you know what I'm saying? So, Like, like I mentioned before, Sogard, Gio or Sherla, again, uh... Uh, how many you know how many guys are out there that are just everybody is raking right now um so in some ways like i don't want to i don't want to take anything away from josh bell because we've seen the type of talent that he has like two years ago he hit a, a decent amount of home runs um he is a good player uh but I, in some ways i'm wondering like how much of because he's he's not not only is he hitting well as you mentioned before He's smacking the shit out of the ball. I think he ranks first in, in exit velocity in baseball right now. Like, yeah. 
His home runs are not cheap home runs. He's no, they're not. killing them right now. Um, and, and as we had mentioned in a prior episode, they're testing the, the baseballs in the minor league, and minor league home runs are up right now. So there's clearly something up in baseball. It's not steroids now. It's the ball that's being juiced. So... Um, maybe maybe that's maybe that's Major League Baseball's way of saying kind of like no, we're not gonna let you take steroids, but here's a little lift to get the gift. game back to get the game back how it used to be kind of in the '90s and and, and, stuff, and you, you know, know what if every if everybody's using the same balls then fine that's it's because it is more entertaining this way so it is it is I'm not gonna lie keep using it, it as is. long as it's a level playing field and at the same time you're you're also seeing great pitching performances like like and and CT real quick. Because you have this guy in your fantasy league, in your fantasy team, and, and uh, you beat me last week, you son of a bitch. Oh, we didn't even talk about that. Wow. What I'm noticing this season is that it's it's not the the speedster pitchers, the pitchers that have the 99 mile an hour fastball, the 102 mile an hour fastball, that are succeeding this season. It's the guys with the slow pitches. It's it's yeah. the the what's the guy in the Cubs, Hendricks. Um, yeah, Kyle Hendricks. Yeah, it's the Kyle Hendricks of the world. It's the Hyun Jin Ryu's of the world. Even CeCe Sabathia is pitching phenomenally right now. Um, so maybe there's there's something to this whole, you know, like soft contact thing. Maybe that's what people should be looking for instead of I instead think, of uh, the guy from, from the Cardinals. You know what I think it is, man? I think it's that maybe these guys are just sitting on those fastballs, you know? Maybe yeah. they're just – maybe that maybe that's why there's so many strikeouts because – they're not trying to change their approach on an 0-2 pitch or a 1-2 or any situation. Maybe they're just always sitting on fastballs. Hence why you're seeing more home runs, maybe, but you're also seeing more strikeouts. They're only sitting on one pitch. A lot of these major league pitchers, their best pitch is that 99-mile-per-hour fastball or that 98, 97-mile-per-hour sinker. So maybe they're just sitting on that one pitch that they know that pitcher's going to go to because that's their best pitch. But and the thing is, I think I think you and I had discussed this before. Um, when you throw that hard, you're taking a chance. Like, not so. The idea is that you throw so hard that that the hitter can't just can't catch up to it. His timing is off. But if you are a smart enough hitter and you just cheat a little bit and just start your swing a little bit early and, and guess, it doesn't matter how hard you swing at the swing at that ball. As fast as it's coming to you, as long as it makes contact with your bat, that shit's going to fly. So yeah. you're taking a big risk, I think, in, in pitching that way. Whereas with guys like, like Hendricks, whose bread and butter is how fast is his fastball? Maybe he touches 90. CC, yeah. I don't think CC touches. I mean, maybe he touches 90 now. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe 92, 93. But generating soft contact might be more beneficial. You know what I mean? So another I guy. Know. Another guy that's looked pretty good this year too is Tanaka. Tanaka's looked really he, good. It looks like he hasn't served up as many home runs as we're used to seeing, but you know, again, I think I think a lot of these major leaguers, since you're probably facing four guys out of the bullpen anyway that throw ninety nine, I think a lot of them are just sitting on that, you know, fastball, which yeah. is to me it's it's all it's the best pitch in baseball and also probably the best pitch to hit because it's yeah. it's more linear, but who knows, man? I, I don't think the the good thing if this if there really is a conspiracy theory about the, about baseballs being juiced and MLB being behind it, there's no way that we'd ever be able to prove it because you could make the argument that pitchers caring more about velocity than location is is the reason why there's more home runs. You know, I mm-hmm. feel like we'll never be able to pinpoint the real reason why we're seeing all these random people hit bombs and all that, like La Stella or. Yeah, right. You know, Kettle Marte and, and all these guys. I don't Dietrich. Know. Dietrich is another one. <laughs> is, is Andrew Ricky. Jones. Andrew Jones is, looks like he's having like a career year. I mean, I don't know, man. There's something. I don't know. There's Brett Gardner. Up. And then you have guys like Jose Ramirez, who, again, I know he's on my fantasy team, but is this the real Jose Ramirez? Like, what's going on there? Oh, man. I don't know. That's the thing. Like, for every argument that you can make that the balls are juiced, you have guys like, yeah, like Jose Ramirez. He's really hasn't, he's not getting any advantage for these new, from these new juiced baseballs or anything. Jose Ramirez, Um, Jose Ramirez is slugging 296 this season. That's, he's hitting one, he's hitting 189. He's not even getting on base. His on base is, is, uh, 289. So he's just, he's bad all around. He's going from MVP caliber to, 
who. You know what I mean? He's turning into a pitcher. Like I think Noah Syndergaard is is hitting better than 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 Jose Ramirez. How about, is. How about we make a trade? I'll take Jose Ramirez. Let me guess for Fletcher. I was gonna give you Vl- Vado. Joey Vado for Jose Ramirez. You make that trade? I don't know. See, Vado is another one, but Vado he's another one. Vado's he's older. older. You know, yeah, like old. this could be this could be just him declining right now because I think he's still drawing his walk. So that he part is. of his game hasn't suffered. You know what I mean? It's it's the making contact that suffered. He I is don't know, he is still he is still drawing a lot of walks for compare you know compared to others, but his numbers are all down. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, he is getting older. He's 35. So yeah. I don't know. He, we'll, uh, talk. Three, we'll talk. We'll talk. Three twenty three, three twenty three on base, but he has a two hundred eight batting average. So I mean, that's that's not. I mean, I. At three twenty three on base, you're creating runs. You're at least you're scoring some. You're on base. You're you're giving your yeah. team a chance to to win yep. games. I don't know, man. I don't know what's going on in baseball. But let's move on to another one. Here's another freaky thing that's happening in baseball. Through forty six games this season, Cody Bellinger is hitting four oh five. Um, crazy, and, crazy. And to put this in perspective, the last hitter to hit four hundred was Ted Williams in nineteen forty one. That season through 46 games, this sounds like an ESPN, like in Sports Center when they do like the crazy connections or whatever. Uh, yeah. Through 46 games, Williams had one more hit and t- in two fewer at bats than Ber- than Bellinger currently has. So, wow. Yeah. So I know I was writing about this today, and, and that connection just came up. I, like I had no idea that this had happened. Um, so it's possible that Cody Bellinger could hit 400 this year. I mean. He's like his. I was looking at his his stat cast numbers. His launch angles down, but his exit velocity's up. He's his uh, his swing isn't as uppercut as it was before. Um, it doesn't seem like he's had a bad week yet this year. Like it, you know, and it's we're seven weeks, seven or eight weeks into the season. Do you think that he could do it? <laughs> four hundred is just like one of those batting. Four hundred is just like one of those mystical stats in baseball. Mm-hmm. Man, I don't know. I'm. I, okay, I'm gonna say no. He's not gonna bat 400 for the whole season. Uh, I think he'll fall somewhere between 340 and 320. Not yeah. Wow, that's a big drop. Yeah, I know, I know. I know that's a big drop, but that's still amazing in today's game. You know, it's a, well, th- that's what surprises me is that it, that he's doing this in in the current game of baseball when teams don't care if you strike out. By the way, his strikeouts are down. He's cut his strikeouts down at by like by almost half. He he would strike out. At a 25, 26% clip um, in his past two seasons. This year, he's striking out at like a 13, 14% clip. So he's cut down on his strikeouts. He's walking more than he ever has before. He's being more selective. He's hitting for power. He's hitting for contact. It's like in, in the piece that I wrote today for Call to the Pen, it's like Tony Gwynn and Barry Bonds, you know, it's, fucked yeah, it's, and had a baby. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> but even even look at look at Joey Gallo. His batting average is up. His strikeouts are still. He still leads the league in strikeouts. His on base but, is up too. Yeah, but he's he's in all the other offensive categories. All his numbers are up. So he's like Aaron Judge and, this year. Yeah, and I feel like he is. He was someone who we could have said had you know him and Cody Bellinger both had an uppercut type of swing. And now, again, I don't know what's going on, but he seemed to have changed something. And I have seen him cut up in some at bats, which is something that I've never seen before. Like these these guys these days don't cut up don't choke choke mm-hmm. the bat that's what i meant to say and he's joey gallo's come out in a few interviews saying that in the past he you know he doesn't really necessarily care so much about strikeouts but that he's always thinking i'm gonna smash i mean you know, i'm gonna crush the the ball when i hit a home run every every at bat now he's saying that yes he's still he's still approaching with the same approach i still want to hit a lot of home runs and i don't but now i don't want to strike out and i want to get on base as much as i can so you know He's admitting that he's going up there with a plan now. It's not just I'm gonna swing at everything and hit everything out of the ballpark. Like you said, he still leads the league in strikeouts, but his his on base is up by a hundred points from last year. Yeah, and cr- and cr- crazy, you know, close to ninety points or close to eighty points for his career. So he he's a threat right now, and he, I think he's making everybody else around him better because uh, Logan uh, Forsyth, who's been on the, on the team for a while, he's playing well too. Like the Rangers. If they had a decent pitching staff, they would actually be a threat in the in the AL West. But all they have is hitting the, right now. Here's the question: You're you're you have a fantasy baseball team. You have Joey Gallo. Would you no. trade him now at the value that he's at? 
would I trade for Joey Gallo? Trade Joey Gallo. Would you trade oh. him away? Oh, oh, oh. Like, okay. Um, it depends. I think that I think that Joey Gallo last year would have commanded less than Joey Gallo does right now. I think you could get a good player in return for mm-hmm. Joey Gallo now. I agree. I agree. Which is, you know, it says a lot. Fantasy is real life, guys. And I'm looking at the stats. So he leads Major League Baseball in, in uh, strikeouts, but his OPS is like 200 points higher than anybody in the top five. That's Will Myers, Jorge, uh, Jose Soler, or Jorge Soler. I forgot his name. Mitch Hanniger. Bryce Harper's another one that leads. He's mm-hmm. tied with Joey Gallo with 62 strikeouts. The difference is that Joey Gallo's OPS is over 1,000, and Bryce Harper's 840, sitting at 847 right now. So I don't know yeah, what man. he's doing, man. I have no idea what he's doing, but good for him. Yeah. Good for him. I, I've always Chicks liked Joey. Dig I've, the long I've, ball. Who? Yeah, I've always liked Joey Gallo, um, and I'm I'm happy to see this. But this is another example. This is a conversation we've had in our fantasy group about strikeouts. He's kind of showing again this year. I know he's striking out a lot, but we're seeing that his his stats are up overall. Maybe mm-hmm. maybe there's something to strikeouts don't matter. You know, there's a difference. There's a difference with a guy. Let's say. I'm trying to use an example. Let's say Gio or Sherla came up and he was striking out at this rate. There's a difference between a guy like Gio or or Sherla or Sherla. I I don't know what the fuck. And um and the guy's Colombian. How do you say that in Spanish? <laughs> or Sherla. Yeah, right. Um and a guy like Joey Gallo. Like if if a guy like Joey Gallo strikes out 62 times, let's say, but maybe he's being selective at the plate now. Maybe he's not just swinging at everything. And this is something that I noticed about Aaron Judge. Um, and maybe I'm losing you already because I kind of jumped into this without prefacing what I'm talking about. But I'm thinking about a guy like Aaron Judge who strikes out a lot. But if you look at Aaron Judge, uh, Aaron Judge's numbers compared to his peers, he takes more pitches than anybody in baseball. Yeah. So to me, what that's an indicator of is that he's being super selective and he knows exactly what he wants to hit. And when he does put the ball in play, he always ranks at the top in Babip because they drop for hits or they go for home runs. Maybe there's something to be said about a guy who isn't just swinging at everything. Maybe his his batting average would be higher or whatever, um, or maybe not. Maybe those maybe they, they weren't the the pitches that he want that he's looking for that he wants to hit. Maybe they would have landed for outs. You know, we're assuming that that all outs are productive when that's not necessarily the case. No, yeah, I know what you're saying. Like, Joey Gallo, Aaron Judge, his rookie year. Aaron Judge in total, the type of player that he is. Yeah, they strike out a lot, but their overall numbers, like they're getting on base and slugging OPS, however you want to look at it, home run totals, uh, you know, everything slugging, they're and, all in the And top I'm talking about 10, Joey Gallo so. this year. I'm not talking about Joey yeah. Gallo in the past. No, no, I, yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. If Joey Gallo is striking out at this rate, yet his averages are OPS over 1,000, he's getting on base 400, you know, at a 400 clip or whatever, uh, I'm. How can you not accept that? You know that those those are elite numbers right there. Yeah. So I get it. Um, but I can't ignore the fact that strikeouts are at an all time high, and yeah, there yeah. are there's a place there's like a place for the ground out, or there's a place for the sacrifice fly, or or making contact and causing something, especially. Definitely. And I'm looking at a team like the Mariners. I've never seen a more d- worse defensive team than the Mariners. You definitely don't want to strike out against that team because no. anything can anything can happen against that team. Or the you know? Orioles. But Did you see that double play the Orioles tried to turn last week? That shit was like the worst <laughs> yeah. play. That was like that was like us when we played in our amateur baseball, like when we were the heaters back in the day. Oh man, you're you're bringing it back right there. Bringing it back. <laughs> <laughs> um, good times. Yeah, good times. So I think there's something to be said about strikeouts not not mattering like i think i think joey gallo last year 207 strikeouts a 312 on base percentage the guy with to me that's an indicator a 206 batting average that's an indicator of a guy who was swinging at whatever the fuck was anywhere near the strike zone and a hitter like that should be more selective and if that means that he's he's not gonna he's not gonna make an attempt at a slider that's on the outside corner that's that's a that's a borderline pitch but maybe it gets called for a strike and he gets called out, I'm not going to kill him for something like that. You know what I mean? Because that's not his bread and butter this year. Again, this might all change. By the end of the season, he might be hitting 206 again with a 312 on base. We don't know. But mm-hmm. for now, it looks he's looking really good. And and if that means that he strikes out a lot still, fuck it. If he plays like this, I'm okay with that. 
Yeah, compare compare Joey Gallo to Mookie Betts. Uh, Mookie Betts half the strikeouts. Yeah, he's getting on base a lot, but his slugging is a lot worse than uh Joey Gallo's. I mean, I'm never gonna take Joey Gallo over Mookie Betts, but these yeah. averages are telling me that Joey Gallo's more valuable offensively than Mookie Betts right now. Right now, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I want to look real quick. How many runs? How many? Do, I bet does Gallo have more total bases, more runs than than Mookie? So Joey Gallo, thirty-two runs. Mookie, forty. Forty. Okay. Yeah. Total runs, okay. I don't have that in front of me now. Total bases. I mean, total total bases, I don't have that in front of me right now. No. Joey Gallo has more total bases. So so Joey Gallo is pushing. You know, but you know, I don't know how many plate appearances. This is too much analytics going on right now. It's hurting my brain. <laughs> um, but the point is. Yeah, I I agree um, with what you said about him being more valuable right now. I don't think by the end of the season, Mookie's going to be more valuable than, than, you know, Mookie had a a horrible, not a horrible, a pretty bad start to start the year. Joey Um, Gallo, Joey Gallo, 175 plate appearances, Mookie bets 211. So I don't know, man, Joey Gallo, he's putting it up right now. Like, yeah, man, good shit. Doing, doing a lot in the less plate appearances. Good shit. He's making himself a threat. I like it. Maybe, who knows, mate? Maybe he'll be trade bait. You love Mookie. I love Mookie. Yeah, I that the point I was trying to make before was that if you if you're listening out there and you have a fantasy baseball team and you're obsessed like I am and you have Joey Gallo, I would trade him. Is what I would do for yeah. a nice arm. Maybe uh, hmm, maybe Blake maybe, Snell. Maybe Blake Chris, Snell. Wow, Blake Snell for 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 Joey Gallo. I don't know about that, man. I mean, Blake Snell's nice. He's great. He's a Cy Young Award pitcher. <laughs> he is that, yeah, he is. But you know, Joey Gallo's ranking top five in offensive categories and stuff. Right you now, know, yeah. I don't know. By the way, Joey Gallo looks like he's thirty-five. He's twenty-five years old. He's making six hundred thousand yeah. dollars a year. What yeah, a bargain! That's crazy. Oh my god. <laughs> the last thing I have on the on the docket, as we call it, is just a nice moment that happened during the Red Sox Astros series this past weekend. I'm just going to play the sound for you, and then I'll tell you what happened. The second baseman. Second baseman. Number 23. I'm 23. Michael Chavis. Michael Chavis. So what you heard there was a little kid announcing Michael Chavis. Uh, the, the Red Sox announcers gave this kid a chance to, to – you know, announce him as he was going up to the plate, and then Michael Chavis hit a home run, and he kind of like tipped his hat to the kid or whatever. I just I don't know. Shit, I love shit like this because I think yeah. it, it it that kid's never gonna forget it, and that kid is gonna go home and for the rest of his life he's gonna remember this and he's gonna be a baseball fan for life. You know, I love shit like this. I love it when Aaron Judge plays catch with guys with people on the stands. And when Josh Donaldson, you know, takes a kid out of his seat and plays catch with him on the field, this is the kind of shit baseball needs to do. They need to interact with people more, like bring Hell people yeah. into the game more. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, I was, that was amazing. I, 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 I saw that notification on my phone all weekend about the kid announcing Michael Chavis, but I didn't click on it to listen to it because every time I saw it, I was like somewhere where I couldn't listen yeah. to it. But that's amazing. Um, imagine. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Ma- it's. I mean, those are just things you can't put like a. What am I trying to say? Like, I feel like you can't. You can't put a price on on those type of things. You know, like that's just life changing. Yeah. Well, for exactly. me, it would have been if I if I was in that kid's position. Uh, that kid's never gonna forget that ever. I remember. You know, it's it's so random, but I remember going to a Yankees Red Sox game when I was like eight or nine, and we were sitting so high up. We got early. We got to that. This is the old Yankee Stadium. We got so we got there so early that we got to see like maybe a little bit of BP. But basically, I saw Pedro running around uh, signing autographs, mm. and I got to see him through a binocular. Like I had my dad brought binoculars that day, and I just saw Pedro like grabbing baseballs, signing them. And even that was like a big deal for me. But I was like nowhere near him. I was in the nosebleeds. <laughs> He's all the way down there like signing baseballs, and I just thought that was like something i don't know i just thought it was really cool even though i was not a part of it yeah so i could just imagine you know the type of impact that these guys like judge playing catch with a kid or mm-hmm. uh you know all that stuff L- little things man like like in the old yankee stadium 
in the 90s at least. I'm not sure if this was the case in the 2000s. Um, but in the 90s at least, the players used to have to park in, in this parking lot that was across the street from the stadium. And they would have to walk from the parking lot through, like, they, they put up barricades um, to get into the stadium. So if you got to the stadium early, you could stand by the barricades and see the players and high-five them and ask them for autographs or whatever. And me and my best friend Gus used to try to get there early. It would always be crowded by that point. And, and the thing is that it wasn't that crowded. Like, you could still see the player from a really close distance. And stuff like that, just, you know, if, if a player acknowledged you or gave you a look or whatever – you know, you became a fan for life. And I feel like things yeah. like that are starting to go away from the game. Like, like now you go to Yankee Stadium and the players park inside of the building, which is, I get it. I understand these guys make a lot of money now. We live in a crazy world. Um, but yeah, you don't get to, you don't get to see the players up close like that. You, you know, again, Yankee Stadium, you go to Yankee Stadium now, you can't sit as close as, as you used to because it's too expensive. Um so you don't get to have those kinds of experiences. And then when you look down on Yankee Stadium, I keep saying that word, the stadium is sold out pretty much every single night. But the first, you know, first few rows are completely empty. And it's not because people can't afford those seats. They're sold. It's that they they offer them so much shit inside of the stadium that they're not sitting out there. So, you know, yeah, it's like that has to that honestly has to change, man, because I, I mean, I, I can't tell you that I've been to basketball games. I've been to a, I've been to a lot of football games, which are insane, by the way. But baseball to me has such a personal feel to it, and they really should. I, I don't know how this would ever work out, but I really wish that you know fans of the game, especially the kids, could sit down the dugout line or behind home plate because that to me is what I always look at. I, I'll always remember being a kid going to a baseball game, and again. I was sitting in the nosebleeds, but seeing Pedro Martinez through binoculars reaching out to fans and at Yankee Stadium just made me believe that things were like that were real. And, mm -hmm. you know, even one time I know this is super random, but uh, one time in Dykeman in, in New York and in Inwood, mm -hmm. uh, Danny Almonte was there. It was right. It was like a little it was a couple of years after he got exposed for being a 15 year old in Little League or whatever the hell that thing was. And yeah. even that to me was like. A, a a real cool moment and mm -hmm. he signed my glove it, it faded away like in the next week because I, I was i used that glove but <laughs> the point is the point is is that that whole interaction with like the public and the players that's that's definitely lost to me in yankee stadium now except obviously when you see judge obviously of all places in right field or left yeah. field right right field and playing and catch and baseball's baseball in terms of financials, baseball is healthy. It's making more money than it's ever had before. So why not give the fans an experience so that you have so that the future of the game is secure? It, it, that the future of the game is in good hands. So what I'm trying to say is like for example, the Minnesota Twins, I think it was the Minnesota Twins, um, they their their stadium isn't selling out. So what they decided to do was to start selling tickets for five dollars. And their tickets, once they went on sale, they sold out immediately. So they decided to do another night and another night and another night. And now they're basically selling out every night. The Baltimore Orioles are ass. We all know that. But they're letting kids in, I think, under 10 or some shit like that. They're, they can go in for free. But why are we waiting for teams to suck to, to start doing things like that? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. why, are, why are we catering to corporate companies? Like... You know, you they have some... suites, you know, give the corporate, sell the corporate, corporate company suites and stuff like that. Give these seats to the fans who are going to be the ones to give you, you know, in a few years, all these deals with Disney and, and ABC and ESPN and this, this and that. They're going to start going away because because these networks are going to start figuring out, hey, people aren't really watching these games and you're not making yourself the fans of the future. You're 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 settling for for nothing right now. You know what I mean? Mm hmm. You can't tell me you can't tell me that playing in front of a crowd doesn't get these players like to another level. Yeah. Right? I yeah. mean, could you imagine playing for a team like can you imagine the Rays? How I I can't I can't I can't help to think that the Rays are not playing to their full potential because they're not playing to a sold out crowd almost every night. And it doesn't have to be a sold out crowd. I think that's crazy. It's a hundred well, it's eighty eight uh eighty one games. 81 home games? 80, yeah, 81 home games, yeah. 81 home games? Okay, I, maybe you're not going to sell out every night, but you got to at least make it look like it's it's the most disappointing thing when you see a team jacking home runs to an empty 
bleachers to the yeah, empty I, bleachers. Let them you know? in for, I, I'm not even kidding. At some point, let them in for free. It's like it's like they the, really should uh, because you're gonna make money on concessions and stuff. Like it's like the movie theaters. Like uh, there was somebody I knew that that worked in the in movie in the movie theater business or whatever. And they said straight up, like, we don't make money off of ticket sales. That they, that shit, we don't make anything on that. What we make our money on is the popcorn, the soda, the candies, stuff like that. You're going to make your money. And again, you're, you're, you're securing your future. It's like an investment. Like, I'm, I'm going to let these fans come in, enjoy the game, have an experience, and make them want to come back. And then when your team is competitive... You know, you you have yourself a fan base that that you didn't have initially. I'm not even. I know that that sounds crazy. Let let just let fans in for free, but why not? You know what I mean? Like they should at the very at the very least at the very least they should let fans in free after maybe like the sixth inning at least something like let let people let people sit in the bleachers or the nosebleeds for free after like the sixth inning. The game is almost over. You'll get free. You'll get some people buying beer. You'll make money. I don't know. I feel like, you know, maybe maybe that's what it's going to get to one day. Maybe seats will be free, but everything else will be pricey, like food and beverages. I don't know. Yeah, Even though it's already kind of pricey in Yankee Stadium, but and and we're making the while there while there is the salary cap and all that stuff behind the scenes, you know, in the shadows or whatever, the the small market teams they're not, you know, they're 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 gonna suffer more at the end of the day after all these billion dollar deals start to go away, because when you watch some games like some Detroit Tiger games or some some Tampa Bay Ray games or the Marlins, it's embarrassing, man. Like it looks like there's nobody in the stadium. Um, yeah. To me, that's you know that's a shame. Like baseball, baseball to, used to be this thing where you you felt like you were a part of it. Like you, you know, a baseball crowd can, can impact the game. Like we've seen Yankee games in the playoffs, especially last season with the Oakland A's, how, you know, they basically admitted like, we just didn't belong on the field with them. Like the the crowd shook the team. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. I know, man. I feel you. All right. I I, I, I feel the same way. Guess what time it is, CT. It's time to say goodbye. Not yet. Closing time. Oh, there we go. Oh. <laughs> we got to get your recap, man, because I'm... Oh, I'm, my God. I'm on Twitter, and people are damn near suicidal, man. What you know, happened on Game of Thrones? Why is everybody so upset? Man, they killed my baby Daenerys Targaryen. They killed Oh, her. daddy, no. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, Game of Thrones, man. Where do I start? That show is so amazing overall. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I was watching the show and I just kept, I just kept re like it. I was watching that last episode last night and I just kept thinking about like the whole show as a, as a whole. And, and I, I saw there was a scene where Jon Snow, the main character had his back turned to a door opening. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, there was a time where in this show that, that could have been the end of him right there. You know, he had his back turned to a door opening, and I feel like Game of Thrones would always take the, would always take that opportunity to stab that guy to death or something, <laughs> you know. But it didn't happen. Uh, the ending, I didn't, I didn't have the biggest problem with the ending. I think I had a problem with uh, Bran, mm-hmm. uh, Bran Stark becoming the king of the Seven Kingdoms. You know, the ultimate ruler, the whole point, the Game of Thrones, the Iron Throne. He's basically the ruler. Uh, and the reason why I have a problem with that is because he turned down being the king of the north, which is less than that. That's like just being the ruler of one kingdom. Now he's the ruler of all six entirely, Ooh. you know? And I know Ooh. you're probably lost. Uh, I didn't mind as much as I think people were mad at that Jon Snow ended up back at the Night's Watch because you can see at the end that he actually crosses over the wall. And basically, he's beyond the six kingdoms. Six kingdoms now. He's basically like a free man. Like he can do whatever he wants. Um, man, I don't know. I don't know. What, I don't know what to say. At one point, uh, Jon Snow stabs Daenerys Targaryen, which is his aunt, but he's in love with her. It's Ooh, a long story. Damn. <laughs> so he stabs her, and she has what I'm telling you is like Hitler's army. Like these these Nazis that will do anything for her. So he stabs her, he kills her, and instead of slitting his throat, they take him in as prisoner mm. for like a couple of days, you know, and things like that is like, I'm just like, it, it, does, it didn't feel authentic to me, but 
it wasn't as bad as the last episode as it was the five episodes leading up to it. Ooh, kind wow, of. really? Yeah, to me, it wasn't as bad because I didn't mind the ending as much. I just, they just didn't stay consistent to me to, to the whole seven seasons before it, you know? And, and by the way, so I don't, again, I don't watch the show. Um, but so I was reading up, I don't know why I read it. I think it's entertaining to hear people complain about a fictional whatever. Is, anyway, is. um, so there was so the the last time we spoke there was a, a coffee cup on in one of the episodes apparently there was a water bottle in one of the episodes did you hear about that yeah 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 I saw that I was like Jesus Christ man like, they're just these guys did not give a fuck at the, the, the exact I was just gonna say the writers producers at, they just got it seemed to me like they got to a point where they're like you know what fuck this like. That, like fuck it we're gonna do like we're just gonna whatever we're that, that's insane man like yeah and you, you know don't, what? you didn't hear about shit like that in any other shows a coffee cup and a water bottle <laughs> nah and you know what that that scene where that water bottle comes up so there maybe somebody could explain this to me anybody listening to the show wants to tweet me at hova mojo at twitter or something nice. but maybe somebody could explain to me what that what happened in that scene because they're trying to decide so basically Jon Snow, who I think is the main character of the whole thing, the best, the hero, like the main character, the protagonist, if you will. Nice. Uh, <laughs> he basically kills the Mad Queen, who uh, who we thought was also a protagonist, but ends up becoming the main antagonist in the span of one episode. Mind you, this is the show that's uh, revered for being for doing so well at character development and then they just wiped it all away in one episode which i think a lot of people were pissed in the episode before this uh, this one mm-hmm. and so basically he kills her they take him in as prisoner and the you know they basically didn't they didn't take it upon their own hands to execute him because they had no leader so this unsullied army that was loyal to Daenerys Targaryen which he killed uh, they're basically just waiting like, you know, that's not for us to decide what gets to happen to this prisoner, that prisoner. You know, what are we going to do? This random guy stands up and and he's like he starts talking about his his experience, maybe why he should be the king of the seven kingdoms. And I don't know what the hell happened. I don't know if Brandon Brand Stark farted or something, but it was like an <laughs> awkward moment where he was interrupted by a noise. And then he looks to his right or his left. And one of the sisters says that he's sick or something. I don't know what the hell happened. And I I played it back like five times and I still can't tell you what happened. Hmm. So, Hmm. yeah. Wow. That was just a random uh, moment in that episode. (laughs) Yeah. Again, I didn't watch it, but it seems to me like the ending was rushed. Um, You took a long time to to film this final season there was only six episodes and there seems like there was just a lot of rushing and a lot of mistakes that could have been avoided which is unfortunate but um yeah so there so now there's there's uh there's like campaigns going out there to unsubscribe from hbo and another one to redo the 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 final season of game of thrones it's like come on guys like all right I understand that it's it's frustrating that you devoted I don't know how many seasons of the show there is eight six eight, eight. five three I don't know six eight, eight eight and they made you wait two years for the last one so. okay so you devoted nine years to this show essentially to be disappointed in the end that that would piss me off too but I mean HBO delivers so much amazing programming that you're gonna cancel your subscription just just for that and I don't know I, I just you know think what though people just go too crazy man. No, yeah, people definitely go too crazy. I'm not going to demand that they remake the fucking last, you know, season or whatever. I'm just, I, I, I still wonder why the writers or the directors, whoever the hell has the say in this, I wonder why they didn't agree to 10 years because I, I heard that HBO was willing to give them the 10 episodes and I don't know why they decided to go with six. Something, but, there's something that we're going to find out, I'm telling you, in the in the coming weeks or months or so, yeah. That is going to explain all of this because the show right, the showrunners of Game of Thrones apparently are slated to direct a Star Wars movie, one of those side projects or whatever. Oh, uh, there you um, go. So there's that in the works. There's the whole thing with George R. Martin, whatever his name is, not he still finishing has to write the, the books. books. He still has yeah. to write the books. Yeah. You know, maybe maybe it was just they just had nothing to go off of. I mean, this is this is like. 
This is like if uh, the way the way that I'm picturing this is is if fellowship the Fellowship of the Ring the the Lord of the Rings trilogy, the Fellowship of the, of the Ring came out part one, then the Two Towers came out part two, and half of part three the the Return of the King was written, and then it was left up up to a whole bunch of random writers to finish it off. I don't know if you could replicate what's going on in someone else's mind. You know what I mean? So, um, I never I never watched the Lord of the Rings. Am I missing out? I think so. I think they're really good movies. Am um, I gonna be complete? Am I gonna be completely lost just watching the movies, or should I? No, you won't be lost it? because the the movies guide you through it in a nice way, and and they make you favor certain characters and stuff. Um, if you read the books, they're confusing as fuck. Um, so I would not recommend reading the books at this point. Just watch the movies. Okay. Well, let me just one last thought on on Game of Thrones and, and the last season. So to me, they had this all-time great show, right? And I feel like some part of me feels like they purposely made season eight not the worst thing that could have happened. Again, I don't think it was a complete waste of a season. It just didn't. It just didn't fit the standard of what was done before it. Like I'm telling you, this last and maybe not even season seven, maybe half of season seven. But everything before season eight was so, and to me, was so good, right? And mm-hmm. then season eight did season eight didn't live up to that. But obviously, there's people out there that did enjoy season eight. But I feel like they did it on purpose, maybe to get people to keep talking about it. Because had that had that season been perfect, what would I have to say about it? Oh my god, that show is so great! You should watch it. Period. No, but instead, there are literally I can find a video right now, forty minutes long of an episode recap of everything wrong with game of thrones Mm -hmm. i feel like people are going to keep talking about this for the next year or so you know it's never really going to go away because because it's game of thrones so if i almost feel like they did it on purpose to get people to be pissed off yeah it's it's easy talking about it it's easy to talk about something when you can trash it it's hard to to yeah. put content together if it's something like, positive. Um, like like The Sopranos. Maybe yeah. maybe the last three minutes of the final season of Sopranos was disappointing for some people. But for the most part, that show was pretty solid, you know, through and yeah. through. Even Breaking Bad, that show was pretty solid all the way through. I feel like I can't really say anything bad about it. You don't really hear people talk about it anymore. I feel like Game of Thrones is always going to be there as like this this thing <laughs> i don't know i was just gonna say um how many shows have you watched where you were completely satisfied with the ending i would say breaking bad i was satisfied with the sopranos because i kind of already knew how it ended mm-hmm. maybe if i didn't and that was like what i got as a first time viewer maybe it would have been different but i would say breaking bad is like maybe the only show maybe yeah i i lo- so i was watching the sopranos when it was coming on i loved the ending i remember everybody going crazy the next day and i was like me too i don't understand why everybody's going crazy i thought the ending was perfect like what did you want to see did you want to see tony soprano getting shot in the head and and Carmela crying and and uh, Meadow and all these people, whatever. No, I thought it ended perfectly, and it left it up to interpretation. Did he die or not? Like, did it just end? Did the story just end there? In my opinion, I think Tony was was killed. Um, yeah, me too. But uh, and and me, I agree with Breaking Bad was a really good ending too, and I thought that the Wire ended well, ended the way the Wire should have ended. Um, never, I never watched this. Don't spoil it. I'm gonna, I plan to watch it. Yeah, so those shows ended well, but then if I think of other shows, like if I think of sitcoms Dexter. that I lo- that I loved, like Seinfeld, the last episode of Seinfeld was trash. Not, nah. yeah. Dexter was trash. You know, the the last episode of Dexter was absolute garbage. The last season of Friends was garbage. The last season of Friends was absolute. The last few seasons of Friends were garbage. Like seasons yeah. nine and ten were horrible. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. How I Met Your Mother, I thought, ended kind of shitty, too. Um, that was random. Yeah, that was random. <laughs> you know what I mean? That. Like, it, it's hard to end a show. When, you've, when you're when you connected to a show, you don't. You almost don't want it to end. Like, you, you want it to continue forward. Like, the, it becomes a part of you. You want to, you know, you want to stick with those characters. The way The Office ended, I thought, was good. But, it, you know, it didn't oh, fit no. The Office. Um, yeah, like, like the, the way that Office ended was good, but the season was not good. The season was not good. Yeah. Um, and I honestly don't think anybody would have been satisfied with anything. And as good as the, no matter what show you watch and maybe Breaking Bad quit while they were ahead. And that's why it was only what, like four or six seasons. Yeah. Five seasons or so. And by the anybody, way, I, with Game of Thrones, like 
what would people have wanted like to john for john snow to be the the leader of all these kingdoms or whatever honestly man yeah i because then because then what what people would have been saying today if that was the case is oh that was so predictable we knew that was going to happen blah 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 it's just you can't satisfy everybody and but you know and, what and i think was was disappointing even though i didn't watch the shows so i'm talking out of my ass is that the whole it seems like the whole the whole last season um didn't uh didn't meet the expectations of the other seasons i think that was the problem um not no, necessarily yeah. the ending you know what it was man i honestly think it, the whole the main reason why this season was unsatisfying was the six, it was six episodes that was not enough for such a great show they should have made it 10 seasons they should have taken their time developing the stories because it's like you took a you took a character who i consider to be like okay john snow was one the number one noble character in the show Daenerys Targaryen to me was like 1B, maybe. Mm -hmm. And from one flick of the switch, she just became the worst. She was executing babies, executing them. Yeah. You know? And I don't think anybody would have ever been satisfied, obviously. The thing about Jon Snow being the ruler of the Seven Kingdoms, no, I didn't expect him to just sit at the Iron Throne and be the king of the Seven Kingdoms, but I did expect him to at least break that mold, like, you know what? We're done with this king and queen shit. Everybody just be free. Everybody just go do your own thing. I'll act as like the standing king while we resolve this. But for the most part, we're done with this shit because this there's too much bloodshed. Maybe that's what I would have wanted. But yeah, I had I was going somewhere with this. And now I've kind of lost my train of thought a little bit. It's all good man. about Game of Thrones. No, nobody would have been satisfied. Maybe whatever. Uh, I, I just thought the whole thing was rushed. And fuck, man, where was I going with this? Back, know, back to you, Manny. Back, back to, to me. You. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. So I'm. I, so right now, my wife didn't watch The Sopranos when it came out, so we're rewatching it, and we're in season six. And I remember when the show came out, how the last couple of seasons of The Sopranos were, were trashed on. Like, oh, it's not the same show anymore. There was a, like that that two to three episode arc where he was in a dream world after he got shot by by Junior in the stomach or whatever. And after rewatching it, I'm I, I, again in my mind. I'm like, why do people hate this so much? Like, it fits. It fits what the show has always been about. Like, yeah, maybe yeah. there wasn't as much bloodshed as there was in the first two or three seasons, but that's not what the show was. At the end of the day, it wasn't about whacking guys, and that's on the that's on the gate. Um, or. <laughs> Or stuff like that. <laughs> it was about Tony having this internal, you know, this internal, what do you call it, conflict of being this mobster. But he goes to therapy because he he's dealing with some shit where, where maybe he yeah. doesn't necessarily agree with his lifestyle, but he has to do it to survive and to put food on the table and to, you know, keep things going. Um, and it, it fit the whole thing. And, I, th I you know... I just think that at the end of the day, not everybody's going to be satisfied. There was there were some people that weren't satisfied with the Breaking Bad ending. I I can't think of a better way that you could have ended that show. Like yeah, like I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, obviously that show. I I think I remember watching it and being like, wow, I just can't believe this is over. Like I can't believe this is the ending. But then mm -hmm. looking back at it, you're right. I don't. I couldn't have thought of a better way. I mean, it basically the way that and spoiler alert for anybody that never watched Breaking Bad, you're screwed. Yeah. At this point, but he you know walter white dies at the end and it's it's good because like we viewed walter white as a good guy even though he wasn't a good guy if you think about it yeah we kind of viewed him as a good guy he died because of his cancer not because someone tortured him to death or shot him to death or anything he died so we you know we kind of get that satisfaction of anybody that viewed him as a bad guy but he it's not like he died in a horrible way that's another thing about game of thrones too man like you got these characters that were all types of evil and didn't to me they didn't get killed off the way that game of thrones it wasn't the game of thrones style of killing somebody off i'm talking about like they're beheading guys in this show and shit you know like yeah, beating yeah. people to dogs type of thing that didn't happen well it's time to behead this episode ct yeah let's chop it off <laughs> um <laughs> so for those of you listening don't forget to drop a five star rating um, and review the podcast uh, wherever you listen to your podcast. Also, don't forget to check out audibletrial.com forward slash welcome to the show to get a free audiobook download and a 30 day free trial. 
Game of Thrones is over, so starting next week, we'll add, we'll, we're going to throw something else in, in this section. Maybe we'll talk about music or something like that. We'll, entertainment, I don't know. How crazy Kanye West has turned. They named their child <laughs> Psalm. I don't know what the <laughs> fuck is happening. Um, I didn't even know that. Yeah, it's fucking nuts. Um, Kim Kardashian keeps keeps popping up babies through other people. Like, all right, now we're good. Oh, anyway, she, um, <laughs> our music she's passing is the bar. <laughs> Crazy, we'll, talk man. About, we'll talk about something. Um, our music is by V Embarga and Rap Turtle Music by Naughty Productions. The logo is by Luigi Gomez. Peace out, everybody. Peace.